Philistine. When you woke up this morning, did you purposely say, I'm going to confine myself to a box? Or do you just avoid putting any conscious thought into today? When you're busy going at it, literally or figuratively, do you ever find yourself pausing for a moment to realize what's going on? Or are you just reacting? When you hear the saying, may I have your attention please, do you continue as you were, or do you consider the information you're about to receive might actually be valuable? When I was growing up, my mother used to ask me to do things, and sometimes her reasoning was, because I said so. Looking back, I wish perhaps I took the time to pause, think, and consider the ramifications of my choices. Good Monday to you. Today is Monday, October 17, 2016. This is episode number 26 of Pause, Think, Consider. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. For those of you that haven't already, which is probably most of you, please go on to iTunes and subscribe to Pause, Think, Consider. This will allow you to get each every episode that we put up exactly when it comes out. Fresh, hot off the presses, delivered to your phone, to your desktop, whatever device you prefer, but it is the easiest and fastest way to get each and every episode. Today's episode is about materialism. For more information on this topic, you can visit the website at pausethinkconsider.com slash material. There's a lot of information, a lot of perspectives, a lot of theories, a lot of philosophies about our society and why we've become materialistic. Why we've become narcissistic. And what, if anything, we can do to stop it. For some people, they don't necessarily believe that we're materialistic. Those types of individuals are ones that believe that others are jealous of them. And rightfully so, that they have that perspective. For many of these individuals, they've worked extremely hard, tirelessly, to build their empire, to get to the 1%, the A-list group that they have become. And as many of them would say, it's not their fault. It's not their fault that they became this famous, this rich, this wealthy. That we, the lower class, who criticize them for their materialistic ways, simply wish we were in their shoes, simply wish that we had the resources that they have, and that if we were, we would do exactly the same thing as them. And that is exactly what I would like to debate today, because my personal philosophy is that is a bunch of BS. Other individuals might disagree with me. They may have a different perspective, a different philosophy. I can only speak for myself, but I believe that is a bunch of BS. So in order to start, before we can get into why I believe that's a bunch of BS, and how I think we can change our materialistic ways, or align 
and get more balance within our life, to not be paralyzed by money or items or to have greed fill our veins, our minds, cloud ourselves to the point that we are debilitated by the chase and the pursuit of more. That nothing is ever good enough. We will never be happy. The pursuit of happiness is an ongoing, ever-flowing journey in which we'll never be able to accomplish until we hit a specific point. One specific moment in which we finally have obtained the resources that we need, that item that we have so coveted, and our lives will change. So where did we get to this point? In my lifetime, there's been three things that I've really noticed that have affected this. The first is a show called MTV Cribs. Growing up, I can remember watching this show for hours upon a time. It's actually probably the main reason my mother banned us from watching MTV. She used to tell us there was only garbage on MTV. There was nothing good that came on MTV. It was just nonsense. And so we were banned. My sisters and I, we were not, we were allowed to watch really whatever we wanted as long as it wasn't MTV. That's not to say that we didn't do it when she wasn't around. I mean, that's just human nature to do something that you're told not to. Probably more so because we didn't understand the ramifications. What watching a show like that, watching a station like that, would do. And I look back on watching that show and being absolutely mesmerized. Mesmerized. Not only from the standpoint that these famous, infamous individuals were letting us into their homes... But the rooms and the construction and the cars and the pools and the women and the food, everything was a total package. And so much of my dreams early on as a result of watching shows like that and being influenced by other other shows, other magazines, was I wanted to be like that. I wanted to one day have what they had. And so much of my generation, the generation that grew up with that, I think can identify with that. The people that you look up to and see how they live and wanting to be just like them. Wanting to have that expensive car. Wanting to have that 12-car garage. That backyard swimming pool with a diving board that goes into a wet bar underneath a waterfall. All of those things manifested in a little show called MTV Crips. So let's move forward. Let's get a little more sophisticated. Let's get a little more cultured. Let's get... Let's get a little more white collar. I look at publications that actually still, full transparency, I still get these magazines. I probably should cancel the subscription mainly because of the waste of resources. Not financially, but in terms of the paper and ink 
that it requires to produce each of these publications. But I've subscribed to two magazines, Men's Journal and GQ. And I've often been referred to by my inner circle as very much a GQ follower from a fashion style of things, a fashion sense. I used to identify with it from the standpoint of I just wanted to look good. Wearing a blazer, a pair of jeans, it's almost, I don't want to say the millennial work attire, their uniform, but it's a smart, sophisticated look. And GQ brings that out. Having that perspective that wearing a tie, wearing a pocket square, wearing a boutonniere, a watch, colored patterned socks, all of those things are okay. And encouraging them. And then all of the items that come together in order to produce that. In general, it's kind of the, the fashion car industries. About having the latest, greatest phones to wanting to have the latest, greatest electronics, latest, greatest. And that what you have is never good enough. You always need something else. I can look back on having lists. This is what I want in my wardrobe. This is the next piece I need. This is the color I need, the pattern. This type of watch. I was never a car guy. I've got a, we'll call it a beat up, but it is a lovingly appreciated 2001, I believe, Toyota Corolla. Missing all four of its hubcaps. Each one of them has a definitive story as to how they were lost. That will be saved for another day. And yet, my view on cars has always been the same. I was never much of a car guy. Never much of a car guy. Always viewing a car... As a means for transportation. Nothing more. And nothing less. As a result of that. High school, middle school. You do a lot of collages. Trying to find yourself. Figuring out who you are. A lot of class projects. People decorating the rooms. A lot of my friends would have posters of women, cars, those types of things up on their wall. Sports teams. I had a couple sports paraphernalia. I never really I never really got into that. Never a bumper sticker guy. Never somebody, never logo-centric. In fact, to this day, I will not wear something, of course, shoes, a little bit different. Can't always get away, particularly in the athletic wear. But I try not to wear clothing that has a logo. I do not want to be, I do not subscribe to being a walking billboard. But publications like Men's Journal, GQ, they promote that type of lifestyle. The lavish, material-driven lifestyle. That you always need the latest, greatest thing.
and then we'll move on to some social media. And I call these three individuals, two of them in particular, because I don't know how else they're really famous, aside from their Instagram account, aside from showcasing their lavish lifestyle. The other individual is arguably, pound for pound, the greatest fighter of all time. But he has a particular nickname, a very dubious nickname. These three individuals, and I will link to them on my website, so you can get a feel for who they are, what they are, what they're all about. Dan Bilzorin, I'm sure I pronounced that incorrectly. The best way to describe Dan is he's he's interesting. It is eye catching. There will be a lot of scantily clad with women in his Instagram posts. He is very infamous for his Instagram account showcasing the lifestyle that he lives. And there's Floyd Money Mayweather. You could say what you want to in regards to his personal life. It's fairly well documented about him going to jail. And his boxing career, very well documented. And his gambling and bets well documented. When your nickname is money, that tells you right off the bat something about that individual. And so much of the pressers, because I remember when Floyd Mayweather in the Olympics and bursting onto the scene, and it was just about boxing. Maybe I was too young the internet wasn't so prevalent. So he really didn't get much insight into his lifestyle. But so much of his press of late, really within the past five years or so, when he took on that money nickname, and showcasing his lifestyle and so much of that, what I talked about earlier, almost demeaning people, any haters, anybody who ever talked negatively about him. And I'll post the video, the quote that he gave when talking about essentially critics other boxers, journalists, speaking negatively about him. And his counter was always, well, I made one million per second or something stupid, something obscene like that. Has that individual ever made one million per second in their life? I don't think so. I made that in a match. I made X amount per whatever time it was. I find a lot of these individuals, like Floyd, like Dan, like this other individual, very, tells you right off the back with his Instagram name, it's lavish bitch. Living, as he says in his profile, a Louis Vuitton style life. So much of it is about touting their lifestyle, why they're better, why you wish you were them. It's an interesting exercise to think about what it would be like to be them. 
I personally find myself having a hard time being able to live in any of those lifestyles. It might be fun, maybe a week, maybe a month, but it's not who I personally am. But so many people identify with that. So many people identify with needing to have bigger, needing to have better, needing to have more luxurious. I thought it was so often just a elementary middle school thing when I didn't have the nicest clothes. My parents didn't have the nicest car. Or the shoes that I wore, I didn't have the new... Newest, latest, greatest basketball shoes or electronics. And yet so much of the story, so much of the American dream that is as if a proclamation of what we must be, of what we want to become, So much of that is a two-car garage with four bedroom, five kids. Probably more bedrooms if you have five kids, but three kids, five bedrooms, a pool, two or three cars, a boat. And I just ask the question, why? Why is it that people find themselves the necessity? I understand owning. Owning versus renting. I totally get that. And people that move out of an apartment or move out of a townhouse or a condo that they're renting to own something. Where I struggle is owning something and then moving and needing to move to something larger. My family no longer fits here. We're no longer comfortable. Why is it that... Why is it that we're not comfortable? Why is it that we require so much extra space? Why is it we need the latest, greatest cell phone? Why is it that leases on cars even exist? The whole premise of you're going to drive something for a two-year period and then trade it in and get rid of it? Sure, from the standpoint of it's always new, so therefore you don't deal with any of the reoccurring problems. But is life just that way? For people. I think for some people it is. And I just don't understand why. Why is life just a least owned adventure with your significant others or relationships, with your items, with your food, with your living situation? Why is it a rent to own and always upgradable? I'm just going to go as fast and as hard as I possibly can. Enjoy so much of it. And I need to get there. I just asked the question, why? Three different articles. All slanted, slanted against being materialistic, but Dr. Steve Taylor on Psychology Today, wrote back in 2012, so a little bit dated, but I still think the content of it rings very true. 
He titled the article as The Madness of Materialism and gets into the psychological nature and what modern materialism is and how to explain what materialism is. There's a great there's a great caption cartoon in there. It says money can't buy me happiness, but at least it can create misery for other people. Another article by Brendan, we'll just call his last name M, out of the Western Herald. The article titled, We Need to Stop Living in a Materialistic World. This is an opinion-based article as to why we need to stop living in a materialistic world. And finally, off LinkedIn, KT Manis, and the article, Materialistic Behavior of a Tourist, talking about the behaviors of a materialistic tourist, which includes overspending and overconsumption, degradation to the environment, unethical conduct, and arrogance, It's right along lots of citations, references. I really like his overspending, overconsumption points in his article. But here's my personal opinion. Three thoughts for you on what you can do or what I think we need to do collectively as a society to be less materialistic. Something that I am incredibly passionate about and have been on this ongoing journey, a continued journey ever since I purchased my own house. And I found myself continuing to develop with each and every passing year. I think since Jeannie and I have met, it has been accelerated. Which is fairly ironic because I've very often associated, potentially unfairly, her and her family as being much more materialistic than mine. Perhaps as a result of that, it has driven me the desire to be less materialistic and continue to be less and less with each passing day and each passing year. For as disorganized as I can be and for as cluttered as my room was as a kid and continues to be to this day. I think part of that, and part of the reason and the desire for being less materialistic is the less stuff I have, the less cluttered I'm going to be. So with that, I give you my three things. The first one being less is more. The whole idea and the concept of quality over quantity. And it can be challenging. I am very much, and Jean talked about this in our cooking episode on Friday, the whole idea of buying in bulk buying bulk spices, something I certainly identify with. The idea of, and I struggle with it, with buying 
a substantial amount. Fill in the blank. Meat. Well, couldn't be meat because then you'd have to consume it. Although, possibly. Having a second freezer like I currently do. So I'm able to bulk shop. I'm able to put in three whole chickens into my second freezer. A whole cabinet of spices. I can have 10 pounds of coconut oil. I struggle with that. I struggle with having that benefit of I only have to go get toilet paper once an entire year. And as a result of buying that large of a quantity, I now save myself time and the effort and for the upfront cost on a per cost, per unit cost, I wind up saving money. And so it's been an ongoing personal struggle, quantity. But as I've been moving more and more towards quality. And the best example I can give you is, again, to go back to clothing. I can remember the first suit I ever bought. I was so proud of myself. I went to J.C. Penney. The brand name, something crazy. Crazy blank. And it was a black pinstripe suit. And it was on the clearance, clearance, clearance. The only way it would have been cheaper is if it was at the Salvation Army or if they put it on the dumpster in the back. I think at some point this two-piece coat and pants, at some point it cost $150. I was a college student, I believe a junior, And I knew I was going to start doing internships. And I needed to have a suit. I needed to have, I needed to look adult. Even though being 21, 22, looking like I was 13. And so I went to JCPenney and I bought this two-piece for like $21. So proud of myself. Telling my mom. And I had a track record in that suit that every time I wore it, and early on, I wasn't wearing it very often. It was only for in-person interviews, that final interview, meeting with people, whether it was an internship or job. Every time I put that suit on, I was given an offer. Whether I took it or not was up to me. But I was always given an offer. It was like my lucky suit. And yet, as you could imagine, $21. The fitting, and it wasn't something I took to the tailor either. That wasn't something I believed in. I just wanted a suit. The pants were about two inches too long. They had the width of a leg that I could have fit two of me in. I used to have to strap a belt to my minuscule waist that it would almost give a ruffle effect at the waist. The jacket came down basically to the knuckle of my thumb. And yet I wore that proud. As a result of that, very much a subscriber of the Nordstrom Rack concept. Oh man, the Nordstrom Rack. I can get discounted brand name clothing. And I still have some of that clothing to this day. Still do. I don't have the suit anymore. I actually, when I moved to the house, that was one of the things that went. I purposely told myself I am not taking this. I need to find, I need to stop finding reasons and excuses to wear this thing because it is never fit. I need to make an adjustment 
and find something that is of better quality rather than quantity. And I went through a recent purge in my clothing. So I had, again, I've been, I've been working on this, trying to have more quality versus just quantity. Trying to limit my choices. For me, when I go into a place like a Walmart or even a Costco, it's overwhelming. Choice is great to a certain degree. But I like simplicity. I like being able to walk in to my grocery store and whatever's on the shelf, I know that's what's fresh. I know that's what's in season. I know that's what's local. Having strawberries in the dead of winter, I have no idea where those are coming from. Or blueberries. And so changing that mindset, I've worked on changing this mindset I want to encourage other people to, to not be strangled by quantity. Have to have three different kinds of beans, 12 different kinds of cheeses, eight different kinds of vegetables, although I do prescribe having a lot of vegetables as a paleotonic eater. that fear of not having enough. And so as a result of that, as you're not wasting resources on getting as many things as you possibly can, now you go and you get one really good pair of shoes, one really good pair of jeans. Jean's grandmother, she shared last week, Grandmother had two dresses, and when she wasn't wearing one, she was washing the other, and just rotated. And that story of her grandmother hit me like a brick in the face. And ever since then, I've been working on getting closer and closer towards down to, I I don't know what my barometer is right now. What is the least amount that I can go with that still makes me happy? I challenge you. What's the least amount that you can go with that still makes you happy? Do you need those 15 pairs of shoes? Or maybe it's three. And then when you have those items, invest in them. Invest in them so that they last. You're not going to feel as bad. When you drop $100 on a pair of jeans, a good quality denim, salvage, raw pair of jeans. It sounds crazy. It is completely against what my mother ever taught me about spending $100 on a pair of jeans. Are you kidding me? It makes sense when I looked at the jeans that had the pre-ripped holes that were bleached. That were frayed, but a raw pair of denim that you mold to your ass, it's going to last a lifetime. It's going to get better with use. Those are the types of products I'm talking about. Some things are just going to be throwaways. It's inevitable. But as much high quality, less quantity, less choice, make it simple. And when I walk into my closet, even now, and I have decreased it substantially, I still in the morning, I wake up and I'm like, God damn, I don't know what I'm going to wear. I've got three different colored jackets five shirts, 
four pairs of pants, three shoes. That's almost still too many combinations. I challenge you to decrease the quantity, increase your quality. It will make those major purchases like a $100 pair of raw denim jeans. It's, it's just a mindset, a mindset shift. One that I don't believe we can do without practice, without a concerted effort. The other thing I talked about, alluded to earlier, experiences over items. Experiences over items. As a gift giver, I love giving gifts. I really do. I think it helps bless other people. It shows your appreciation for them. My first ever Christmas that I went and spent with Jean, I was just blown away by the amount of stuff. Appreciative, flattered, but blown away by the stuff. And I brought some stuff because I knew her family was much more into things, but going on year number three, I always, I have a little little personalized something for each member, which is slowly becoming more consumable and less material because a consumable in theory, should be a short duration enjoyment and show of appreciation. But then an experience that lasts a lifetime. That t-shirt that you got, that you gave, that you thought was so memorable to your father, your mother, your significant other, how often do they really wear that? Especially when they've got 30 other t-shirts. Now maybe if they've only got two and that's number three, pretty high likelihood they're going to wear it. But when you've got quote unquote everything, that's sort of the philosophy that I've taken is that everybody has everything. Everybody wants more things. Oh, if only I could have this. Well, who says you need that? You may want it, but is that really going to give you enjoyment? So that's why I've taken the approach of giving experiences over items. Because experiences are memories. And memories can last a lifetime. Memories are something that you cherish and you bring up over and over and over. I remember the first dinner that Jean and I had. I remember the first dinner when Jean met my parents. Ironically, I was a mute. I couldn't talk because I had lost my voice at karaoke the night before. We went to this great restaurant called Pam Beach in Portland. Cuban restaurant. I even think I got I got the red snapper. My father loves plantains. I don't quite remember what he got. Feel pretty eh, maybe I didn't get the snapper. Again, the food irrelevant, great quality. But I will always remember that dinner because of poor Jeannie. Just trying to converse. First time meeting my parents formally. First actual time was date number three when we had to make a rush to the airport to pick my parents up from vacation. Hi, welcome home. This is Jean. Yeah. Dinner number one. 
came about a month in. Had to let him know that we were serious. Or she wasn't just a for funsies relationship. But I will never forget that. That experience. What we ate. How much it cost. All those things. And my father paid for it. So actually maybe he didn't. I might have actually picked that tab up. Probably because I couldn't talk and I subjected everyone to having to socialize together without being able to be the conduit between the conversations. Whenever I go to concerts, it's hard for me to understand the people that get the t-shirts, that get the posters, that get the item to help them remember the experience as if it almost diminishes the value of it. That I will not possibly be able to remember this event, to remember this night if I do not have this item that I can signify and show off to my inner circle to show how cool I was. That's why so often, and I've utilized it a little bit more as a result of Jean with taking photos, taking videos at things that she's not experiencing because I wish she could together. But there's also times I purposely don't. Like she's asked me countless Countless times. Oh, send me a photo when you're out in Bend. My favorite location in the whole world. Bend, Oregon. And I haven't done it. In fact, I refuse to do it. She asks me every time, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Never do it. And I never do it because I don't want to diminish the importance of that first time she experiences it. Sure, she can go online. She can look at photos. She could even look at my photos. But I want it to be special. Not that she has this photo and she has this special photo sitting up in your room so that then she can try and match that vision that she's always had in her head. No. It's about experiences, not items. And my third and final is give the bird to social norms. Give that mile-high salute to what we socially believe is the right or just thing. And I bring this up because of an experience Gene and I had this weekend, Saturday. We went to, rode our bikes 10 miles away, one way. To the Smud Tiny House competition. I'll link to it on the website. Got a huge, just a ton of press. Ton of press. All over the news. Probably even got picked up nationally. What they were telling us at the event was it was the first kind, at least that they were aware of, in the U.S. And it had 10 different universities in a competition to build the most self-sufficient, reliant, tiny house. And it was a competition. People won grant money based on the awards and overall grand champions. But the amazing thing was the number of people that were out there. They said something like there was 15,000 people. G and I showed up at noon. They basically closed it off at 4. We were there till about 4.30, trying to rush around and see if we could, at uh, last minute, get in. It was taking us an hour, at a minimum, to get into these houses, to tour it, to talk to the builders, the students. It was incredible. Incredible. 
and yet I asked the question to Gene. Of the 15,000 people that showed up today, now granted, it was a free event, free and open to the public. If you were purchasing anything, it was from the food truck vendors that were there. So here were these 10 tiny houses and activities for the kids. And yet the lines to get into these things, an hour for each. I kept finding myself asking the question to Gene, how many of these individuals would really actually take the step? and build their own tiny house or even pay somebody to build them and and to actually live it. Because I don't think people understood the ramifications of it. It wasn't just a dollhouse. It wasn't just a cute little living RV. It, It was a lifestyle change. That in order to actually live in the one of those, the whole concept, the whole idea is to not be tied down by all of your stuff. It's the whole reason of getting rid of the garage. Not, well, we need an extra trailer for all of our extra shit. It's not having that giant walk-in closet. Entire shoe rack. I just had the hardest time believing that even if you take out the kids and say there was 5,000, that 10,000 percentage of it would be very high. It was so telling listening to that mother tell her kid, Oh, this wouldn't this be a fun playhouse for you? That's not the point. It's not the point. And so theories like that challenge the social norms. It challenges what we believe we need to be happy. That we need more than 200 square feet. That we couldn't possibly find a way to coexist in that little space with that little stuff. But that's That's what all of these other individuals are trying to showcase that we need. We're constantly bombarded with what we need, what what we don't have, what we have to have. And that's not to lay blame on Kim Kardashian. It's not her fault. It's what she chooses to do with it. I don't even necessarily have a problem with that. I personally wouldn't do it. And that is the difference. That is the difference. And what I am encouraging other individuals to do to not get tied down. To not be dependent on your happiness being tied to achieving a level of a materialistic achievement that you can not be fulfilled unless you have a certain type of car or so many pairs of shoes. That the simplistic things in life, the quality of the items that you do choose in spending your money on. I look at individuals that aren't able to pay their bills as a result of purchasing luxury handbags. Or they're not able to put food on their table because of the car they drive. I always hear so many excuses. I have to, I have to, I have to. Nobody says it is modern conveniences. It is a modern convenience my Corolla. That's why 
and it's not because of the weather. I would go find materials necessary to do it in the torrential downpours that we are now going to go into in the Pacific Northwest. It's a time thing for me. I have other things during the winter time that I spend my time on that's different than any other time of year. So time is not a luxury for me. As a result, I drive my car, but otherwise I try and utilize my bike as much as possible or walk. It's just bucking that trend. It's eliminating that paranoia that you're not going to be good enough because you don't have X. And I say give the bird to society that tells you what you need to have. You're the one who chooses your happiness. Not your family, not your significant others, not your boss. It is you. You're the one who chooses what happiness is. And it doesn't have to be what anybody else thinks. That's why the travel hacking community is so... Or... The independent living. The digital nomads. Why all of those communities are so exciting. I personally can't come to grips with letting go and and doing that. But they're so inspiring. Not tied down to a specific location because of a a home or anything else. They're just out there enjoying experiences each and every day. That you or I may never experience in a lifetime. They're experiencing on a daily basis. Those are the types of things that we can all experience by not being tied down to what society tells us we need to have, what we need to covet, what we need to make us happy. So in recap, we talked about materialistic influences, individuals, publications, TV programs that have affected our views as a society. The show like MTV Cribs or publications like Men's Journal and GQ and Instagram fame, Dan Bizarin, Floyd Money Mayweather. Those individuals planting the seed, showcasing to us what we need, what we wish we had that we can't have. This idea that we can never be satisfied with what we currently have. That you have to go from the house with no backyard to a house with a giant backyard to the house with a three-car garage to the house with a four-car garage with an RV and continue progressing up and up and up to the point that we're no longer able to afford what truly makes us happy. We had three different outside sources from Dr. Steve Taylor on the article, The Madness of Materialism. We need to stop living in a materialistic world and materialistic behavior of a Taurus. And then the three suggestions that I gave to helping break free, to get outside of being materialistic, to get your life more in line and dictate your own personal happiness is to take the approach that less is more, a quality over quantity. Utilizing those resources on the best that you can possibly get, not on getting the most of what you can get. Choosing experiences over physical materialistic items. Because memories last a lifetime. Material objects have a lifetime. 
and finally giving the bird to the social norms, just like the tiny house movement is doing, to what society says we need to have. What we need to have for our lifestyle. I want to thank you all for listening today. Please go check out the website at pausethinkconsider.com slash material. And don't forget, if you haven't already, subscribe to iTunes. You can search for us on iTunes. I look forward to talking to you all again tomorrow on Pause, Think, Consider.